Now the use of fossils in science and industry. So the whole point of this class is to introduce you to paleontology, but uh, it, it's mostly to give you a toolkit in order to use your paleontological knowledge for bigger purposes. And those bigger purposes are science and industry. So depending on if you want to become a researcher or if you want to work uh, in the industries, you can use anyway, you can use fossils uh, to make your life easier in many respects, at least geologically, uh, if you if you work in the geological field. So um, the first use uh, and the main use of fossils for science and for industry is dating rocks. With the fossils, you can date rocks uh, at least approximately using uh, what we call relative dating or biostratigraphy. So the biostratigraphy is the use of fossils to correlate strata. So strata are the layers of rocks, the different horizon of rocks that you can see on this schematic drawing. Uh, and for this, we use the law of similar fossils. Two sedimentary rocks formed at the same time will trap the same fossil species. Wherever they are in the world, if you have a sedimentary rocks that forms now, it will trap the same species because the same species live everywhere. Everywhere you have humans, you have cats, and if uh, a sedimentary rocks forms, it will eventually trap uh, a cat uh, and the cat will fossilize. And wherever is that, and in millions of years, when people will find a rock in North America and in South Africa and they will find cat and they will find cats inside, they will know that these rocks formed at the same time. So that's the that's the big idea between the behind the law of similar fossils. So in application, this is how it works. You look you have your different geological sections. So you have been in uh, four different areas and you find different fossil contents in each of these layers. So now you compare those fossil contents and you find that there are these blue oyster-like fossils and they are here, they are there, they are there, and they are absent here. And you find those red seashells, those, those red uh, snails, and those red snails are absent in this area, but they are present there, there, and here. So now how do you correlate those strata? You have to align this one with this one and this one, and you have to align this one with this one and this part. And what does it give you? So once this one is aligned here, you can see it's right at the top, and this explains why you don't find the blue oyster. It's because the blue oyster are very low in the stratigraphy and that part of the stratigraphy is not preserved there. So thanks to the, 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 the biostratigraphy, thanks to the law of similar fossils, you can say, even though you have not dated the rock directly, you don't have any date for those rocks, you don't know how many millions of years they are, but you know that at least this rock here is a lot younger than this rock here. So the, and this is all thanks to fossils. And, and for, to apply the law of similar fossils, you need index fossils. So these fossils, these, uh, uh, these, these, these hypothetical fossils that I use there, they are index fossils. Index fossils are good stratigraphic markers, the fossils that you can use for biostratigraphy for correlation. And these index fossils, they need to have four properties. They, they need to have four special features about them. The first of them is that they have to be abundant. If you can't find anything, these fossils are no use. Second, they have to be ge geographically widespread. If you find the fossil only in one place in the world, you cannot correlate anything with that. Third, this index fossil, these index fossils have to be stratigraphically as short-lived as possible. We will see later that this can vary a lot, but the shorter, 
the, 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 the shorter is the stratigraphic horizon limited by an index fossil, the best it is. And, and the fourth property, and probably the most important, they have to be easily identifiable. If you cannot identify the species, so hence the importance of taxonomy, if you cannot identify the species, you cannot do anything with your index fossil. So abundance, geographically widespread, stratigraphically short-lived, and easily identifiable, and this is the perfect fossil. Um, and then, when you have enough index fossils, you can define uh, strata that are only defined based on similar fossils, and we call them biozones. So here, for example, if we take back this example, you have here the blue oyster biozone. And here you have the red seashell biozone. And you know that if you find a red seashell anywhere in the world, you know that it correlates with the red seashell biozones in those area, area A, B, and D. And if you find the blue oyster, you know it correlates with this area, with the this part of the stratigraphy in area C, area A, and area B. So it's fairly simple. It's, uh, it's just you find the same fossil, it's the same age, and you correlate the strata this way. And you can also use another law to date the rocks with fossils, and it's a bit different. It's just the law of evolutionary succession. And it's very, it's very, very, it's very simple. It's just primitive fossils are older than derived fossils. So the primitive species are usually older than the less primitive species. That's the law of evolutionary succession. So the more, is the more a fossil is advanced, the younger its encasing rock is, the more a fossil is primitive, the older is the rock. So really, you can, that's really the law of evolutionary succession in a nutshell. The more a fossil is primitive, the older is the rock. So now a case, a case study of a, an application of biostratigraphy, uh, a, a textbook example of application of biostratigraphy is the South African Karoo. <clears throat> so it's an internationally uh, renowned example for Karoo by, for, uh, for biostratigraphy. The Karoo fossils have been used to define eight biozones based on their species content. So you have Eodicynodon, Tapinocephalus, Pristerognathus, Tropidostoma, Kistecephalus. Remember, we, told, we talked about it at the beginning of this lecture. Dicynodon, Lystrosaurus, and Synognathus. So all of these are different species of what we call mammal-like reptile, but it doesn't matter now. And you can see that this, each color corresponds to the map to a particular area, and all of these areas have been correlated to each other based on their fossil content so that we can now safely say that everything that is in this color here in this light orange dates from the same age because they all contain a fossil called tapinocephalus and all the things that are in blue is a, a little younger and they all contain a fossil called dicynodon, and the green inside contain fossil called Lystrosaurus and Synognathus, and they are a little younger again. So how does it work? And, and uh, what is amazing about that is that you can also not apply it only in South Africa, you can also apply it internationally. So in South Africa, you find, for example, in the light orange zone, you find uh, Tapinocephalus, but you also find another species called Australocyodon, uh, and the date from the Middle Permian. So Australocyodon is found in South Africa, and we know that in Russia we find a very similar species called Cyodon. You can see how likely, likely they look, uh, how alike, sorry, they look. Sinophoneus from China, you have Pampaphoneus from Brazil, and you can see they all look the same. And you know that from China, they were able to get an, uh, an absolute date, uh, which is 260 million years old. So now you know that the South African, the South African area in light orange is 260 million years old, not because you've dated 
those rocks directly, but because the rocks that correlate with it in China are 260 million years old. Then in the blue area, so a little younger, you know that they are a little younger because they are on top of the, of the light orange area, you find these animals uh, that are called the Gorgonopsians from the late Permian. So the Gorgonopsians, you have Aloposaurus from Tanzania, you have Gorgonops from South Africa, and you have Inostrancifia from Russia. And in Russia, they managed to get a date, an absolute date, uh, thanks to, who knows, uh, radiometric dating. The absolute date that they got is 255 million years old. So now, same thing, because you know you find the same kind of species in Tanzania and in South Africa, you can safely say that this blue area is 255 million years old. And this is consistent with the previous date that we got, 260, because it's younger and we know that these rocks in blue are on top of the light orange rock. You can see they are younger. So this is the kind of date you would expect from these rocks. And again, if you move to the orange area, the rocks are a little younger and they have a very specific fossil content. Here, that species called, uh, these species that belong to a family called the cynodonts. And you can see they all look the same with those big rabbit-like uh, teeth uh, and this big uh, sagittal crest here. And you have an example in South Africa, in Europe, in China, and in North America. And in North America, it so happens that they could date their rock to 201 million years old. So we know that the same rocks in South Africa, Europe, and China are the same age because they contain the same fossils. So this is the principle of correlation uh, by the book uh, based on the South African Karoo. And this is not, and this is not actually an, uh, an invented example. This is actually what people have been doing for the last uh, 50 years with the Karoo fossils, well, even for the last century, actually, uh, with Karoo fossils. So biostratigraphy use relative dating to correlate strata, and we can apply this worldwide to correlate the different geological horizons that contain the same fossils. And this way, ge geological times were divided according to their fossil content. So this is what is represented here. You can see that each layer contains a particular assemblage of fossils. So the most the, the oldest rock contain only invertebrates, you can see, and then you have the first vertebrates, the reptiles, and then you have the mammals arising in the Cenozoic. So you can already see, even though we have not, we are going to go deeper into that later during the, this course, but already you can see that the, the, the three biggest divisions of time, the Mesozoic, the, the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic, have different uh, fossil content, invertebrates in the Paleozoic, vertebrates in the Mesozoic, and mammals in the Cenozoic. So, and this is a, a simplified version of the geological uh, time, time chart. I'm afraid you have to know this by art, and, uh, and you can expect that this will be in the exam. So I'm now waving my red flag to you. My big red flag is there and it tells you, know this by heart. And anyway, if you want to become a geologist, you will have to know this by heart. Uh, so this includes the dates here, and this includes the name of the periods and the era. And here I put also the, the faunal ages. So I told you the Paleozoic has mostly invertebrates and the most conspicuous invertebrate that you find in the Paleozoic are the trilobites. So, and we will see what are trilobites later. And in the Mesozoic, you find reptiles and the most conspicuous reptiles are the dinosaurs from the Mesozoic. And in the Cenozoic, you find mammals. 
And uh, there was not enough space to do this for every single stage, but you can guess now that every single of these periods have a particular fossil content. And that's why they were divided. So that division seems very arbitrary because uh, you can see the dates, they are not regular intervals, but actually the arbitrariness, the, 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 the reason why those dates are not at a regular space, it's because of the fossil content. All the rocks of the Cambrian contain the, the same types of fossils and all the rocks of the Ordovicians contain a different types of fossil from the Cambrian and the Silurian that is typical of the Ordovician and so on. And it's the same thing for the Paleozoic. The fossils in the Paleozoic in general are different from the fossils from the Mesozoic. So this is why those divisions of time, this is where this division of time come from. They come from the fossil content of the, the rocks around the world. And you have to know this uh, by heart. You can be sure it will be in the exam. It was already in the exam last year and the year before. <laughs> Another big use of uh, fossils in science is, of course, the, to document the evolution of species. And before we start with the evolution of species, I just want you to think just maybe 10 seconds about what is evolution. And for this, I put that picture. And that picture, I find it very interesting because it it exemplifies what evolution is. Uh, well, actually, it's a metaphor of what evolution is. So the question in this case is, how did that tree grow above this hole? How does a tree grow above a hole like this? How that tree ended up here? So now you can think about an answer. So you can pause the video and think about an answer. There's no quiz at this level. So don't look for questions in the below the video. The, there's no quiz. It's just a question. Think about what is evolution. Uh, and in this context, how do, just think about how does that tree, how did that tree ended up like this? So one of the answer you can think is that the, the tree grow some roots on both sides of the of that hole so that it can hang up like this but you can guess that it's deeply unsatisfying uh yeah you, they, they, there's very there's very little explanation for that except that this hole was not always there this hole is actually a riverbed and the river flew through the through the, the roots of the tree and, and remove the sand until there was nothing left under the tree. So that's one explanation. And what is evolution in this context? Well, why I think this picture reflects what is evolution? Because evolution is just understanding that things were different in the past. If you only look at the present, it's very difficult to understand how the tree ended up like this. But when you look in the past, then you realize that things were different, that here there was some ground here to support that tree in the past. And evolution is the same thing. You have to look in the past. And that's exactly what we are doing. We have to look, we are going to look in the past to understand what was life before, because life was different before. And that's what evolution is. And so in an evolutionary context, you expect that, that older rocks contain more primitive species. So that's the law of evolutionary succession that I told you before. It comes back here with the evolution of species. So the deeper you look in time, the more primitive are the species. So if you look at 3.5 billion years ago, there were only single cells organism. And then you move up to 2 billion years ago, you start to see the first multiple cells organisms, the first organisms with more than one cell in their body. Then you look up, upward again, you end, you end up half a billion years from now, so 500 billion years. 
and you find the first fish and the first invertebrates. And then 400 million years, and you find the first amphibians. And then 300 million years, and you find the first reptiles. 200 million years, the first mammals. 65 million years. So now we are, we are no longer talking about hundreds of million years. We are talking about dozens of million years. And 65 million years, we are the first primate. Three million years ago, you have the first Australopithecine. And 300,000 years, the first modern human. So you see, the more you're moving up in that spiral of time represented here, and the closer you go, you get to the modern species. And that's the evolution of species, as documented by the fossil record. And what you would expect, because species are multiplying, because species uh, are, are, being, are being evolved from each other, so one species gives birth to many more species, that, and themselves they give birth to many more species. It's the phenomenon co uh, known as speciation. So because species are evolving and are giving birth to more species, you expect an increase in biodiversity, at least in average. And this is actually what we, we find. So from almost zero at the beginning of the Cambrian, so 540 million years ago, there were only a couple of single-celled organisms and a couple of multiple-cell organisms before that. But at the onset of the Cambrian, you have the first big event of speciation that creates more species. And since the Cambrian, species, the species have tremendously increased. The number of species, uh, well, actually, they, they look at the number of genera, but it's the same thing. In this particular case, it's the same trend. There are more species now than there were in the Cambrian. So there is an overall increase of species, number of species through time with periods of mass extinction. So extinction of species, uh, five of them actually, late Ordovician, late Devonian, late Permian. You can see that the late Permian almost killed everything. And the late Triassic was not no better. And the late Cretaceous. The late Cretaceous is very famous. It's the mass extinction that uh, during which the dinosaur went extinct. So this steep decline includes dinosaurs. And then you have the, the mammals that took over after the dinosaurs. So you can see an overall increase in the number of species punctuated uh, by times of mass extinctions that reduce the number of species. And then the number of species grew again by speciation. So that's the overall story of the evolution of species through time. So now, uh, something very important that you need to know about the evolution of species, and um, many people uh, will argue about that, but I think it's an important thing that I need to tell you now. It's that the theory of evolution is actually a vector of social equality. If if you, tell, if you let the others tell you where you come from, then, then uh, you lose equality. Uh, how can I put that? The, yeah, if you know where you come from, then no one else will tell you where you come from. Uh, consistently through the history, you will see people that get into power and rewrite the history of their origin to justify their position of power. And I think in the South African context, you know exactly how this can go wrong. The people who invent glorious origins uh, to just to justify that they are in power. And this, and actually having the theory of evolution telling you that everyone is equal, everyone comes from the same common ancestor, and everyone evolved during the same amount of time since that common ancestor. The common ancestor of all humans, of all modern humans, is 300,000 years old, and it's for everyone on Earth. So everyone on Earth evolved 
for 300,000 years old. So everyone on Earth is as evolved as his neighbor. <laughs> so there's no primitive people, there's no evolved people, everyone is the same. And that's why the theory of evolution is a vector of social equality. It's just when you know where you come from and you know that your last common ancestor is the same wherever you come from, then you, you're looking at equality straight in the eyes. So yeah, so you need to know your theory of evolution. Uh, if not for everything I've already told you, for that it would be, it would be great. Time for the quiz.